Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all warm and safe. I am not too comfortable videoing myself, so please, I, I beg your patience. Last Sunday at the annual parish meeting, Father Kirk defined a spiritually healthy parish as one where people feel safe being themselves. In a healthy church, in a healthy world, we're comfortable sharing our true authentic identities with those around us. In today's gospel, Jesus doesn't feel safe doing this. The Gospel of Mark is the oldest of the four Gospels, and many scholars believe that it is the most accurate account we have of Jesus' life on earth. It is full of secrecy. Jesus repeatedly performs miracles, but instructs onlook onlookers to say nothing about them. Just before this morning's lesson, in verse 25, he rebukes an unclean spirit who has possessed a man in the synagogue. The spirit says, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus tells the spirit, be quiet. In today's lesson, he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In chapter 3, we are told that whenever the impure, impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God, but he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. It isn't just demons Jesus silences. He commands a leper he has healed to say nothing to anyone. After he raises Jairus' daughter from her deathbed, he tells everyone who is present not to let anyone know about this. He does the same thing after he heals the man who cannot hear or speak. He does it again after he heals the blind man. There are many theories about why Mark is so filled with secrecy and silence. The most famous explanation, proposed by Lutheran German theologian William Reedy, is that the writer of this gospel invented the secrecy motif to explain why Jesus wasn't more widely recognized as the Messiah during his lifetime. Reedy wrote his book, The Messianic Secret, in 1901, and theolog theologians have been debating it ever since. But if these incidents really happened, instead of being invented after the fact, Jesus could have had urgent practical motivations. There were a lot of itinerant preachers and healers, both before and after him. He might have been trying to pass as one of them to pretend that he was just another holy man for several reasons. First, he might have wanted to manage the crowds that kept hemming him in. Even as just another holy man, he could barely move from place to place. How much worse would it have been if people had known he was the Messiah? He could also have been trying to control the timing of his death and resurrection, knowing that he would be executed if his true identity was revealed. To keep doing his work of healing and preaching, he needed to stay incognito for a little while longer. Jesus Christ Superstar was trying, not very successfully, to be Jesus Christ Secret Agent. He didn't want anyone talking about him. Not his friends, not the people he'd healed, not the unclean spirits who kept gleefully proclaiming that they knew him. At the risk of some discomfort, let me talk about demons for a minute. The received wisdom is that they lie. I don't believe in physical demons, although I know many people who do, but I've had plenty of experience with the internal ones. The little voices in my head telling me I'm worthless and stupid, that no one loves me, that I'll never amount to anything, and furthermore, that I have really bad hair and need to completely revamp my wardrobe and should never appear on video. I imagine some of you have voices like that too. But those demons aren't telling the truth, right? Every self-help book I've ever read, every therapist I've ever visited, has sworn that those demons are lying. We need to learn to silence them so we won't believe what they say, so we won't sell ourselves short and fail to become the people we're meant to be. 
The demons Jesus casts out, though, tell the truth. They know who he is, but they aren't telling the truth in love. They don't mean him well. He needs to silence them so that other people, namely the Romans, won't hear them and cut short Jesus' life and ministry, preventing him from becoming the healer and teacher and friend he's meant to be. Jesus is trying to avoid being outed. Most of us both yearn to be known and fear it. The phrase, if they really knew you, is part of how our internal demons torment us. If they really knew you, they'd know you cheated on that test, on your taxes, on your spouse. If they really knew you, they'd know you're scared of failure, of driving, of the dark. If they really knew you, they'd know you're struggling with drinking, with debt, with depression. Many of us fear shame and judgment, condemnation in the court of public opinion. But for all too many people, being known carries even grimmer penalties, tangible physical risks, beatings, imprisonment, death, crucifixion. Last week, I had a long conversation with a friend at work she moved to the United States from Russia when she was 20. She told me about her grandmother, Lydia, who was Jewish. During Stalin's reign after World War II, Lydia, like many other Russian Jews, was terrified of persecution, fear only heightened by the recent horrors of Hitler's death camps. To protect herself, Lydia took extreme steps. She burned her house to the ground with all her papers in it. She moved to the other side of the country and created a new identity. Under her new name, Ludmila, she became one of the first female surgeons in Russia. To keep doing her work of healing, she hid her true, authentic self. Stalin died in 1953. The Soviet Union dissolved in 1991. But long after that, Lydia's family still didn't know her real name. She told them only at the very end of her life. And even then, she refused to speak Hebrew. She listened to it. She understood it perfectly. But she wouldn't say the beloved prayers of her tradition aloud. The fear of discovery and death still ran too deep, even when she would have been safe. Lydia revealed her secret at the end of her life. Jesus, at the end of the Gospel of Mark, does the same. At his trial, when the high priest asks him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus answers, I am. He was never just another holy man, just another itinerant preacher and healer. He knew it, his followers knew it, the demons knew it. Ultimately, the religious and military authorities know it too, and everything happens exactly as Jesus foretold. His arrest, his execution, his resurrection. None of Jesus' secrets stayed hidden. There wouldn't be a church if they had. Centuries after the crucifixion, we tell the truth about Jesus not to persecute him, but to celebrate and worship him. We tell the truth in love. He is beyond earthly harm. He has conquered death. The cross and the tomb hold no more terror for him or for us. He is safe, and because he is, we are. Even in the Gospel of Mark, we see glimpses of that safety. When his followers see him walking on the water and mistake him for a ghost, he comforts them. Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. He tells the messengers mourning Jairus' daughter, Fear not, only believe. As Christians, how can we offer that safety to others? In a spiritually unhealthy world, how can we reassure people in real and pressing danger because of their religion, their nationality, their sexuality, their gender identity, 
that we cherish their true authentic selves? How can we give them the healing balm of being known and cherished instead of rejected? Surely part of the answer is respecting others' silence, allowing them to choose the moment when they will reveal themselves. Part of it is letting them know that we are willing to listen to whatever they are willing to tell us. And part of it is being careful always to avoid harm, to share only the truths that we can speak in love.